on World News Tonight. Putin's warning. Russia is urging a halt in the supply of ammunition to Ukraine as the attacks deal heavy blows on each side. Attacks continue. Ukraine is falling victim to even more attacks as Russia is taking no chances, increasing fire on vulnerable areas across Lviv. Unprecedented leak. The U.S. Supreme Court faces the heat following the spread of a draft decision to abort abortion. And Day of Light. Italians celebrate the importance of water with a spectacular light festival across the Alps. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off with the latest updates on the continuing war in Ukraine. Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke with his French counterpart where he urged the West to halt its supply of weapons to Kiev. He also stressed that Moscow is still remaining open to dialogue. In a phone call with French President Emmanuel Macron on Tuesday local time, Russian President Vladimir Putin appealed to the West to stop supplying weapons to Ukraine. According to the Kremlin, Putin also urged the West to put pressure on Ukraine to halt the ongoing atrocities. The Russian leader told his French counterpart that Moscow is still open to dialogue. Macron, for his part, according to the Kremlin, explained that global food security was under threat due to the Ukraine war. He also called on the Russian leader to allow evacuations from the Azovstal steel plant in the city of Mariupol to resume. Macron is one of the few Western leaders to speak to Putin since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February. Against his backdrop, Russia began a renewed attack on the Mariupol steel plant shortly after the first group of civilians was evacuated from the facility. Russia explained it was using artillery and aircraft to target firing positions taken by Ukrainian troops. This comes as the mayor of Mariupol estimated over 200 civilians remained trapped underground with about 100,000 civilians in the city. The Ukrainian military high command said Russia is calling in troops based in its far east to join the battle. According to the Center for Defense Strategies, a Ukrainian think tank, the Kremlin was concentrating its recruitment on the Far East and Siberia to sustain the war in Ukraine. Russian strikes hit several regions across Ukraine on Tuesday, including the western hub of Lviv, six railway stations and a mountainous region bordering Hungary, which was targeted for the first time. The city of Lviv, targeted by Russian missiles. Early on Tuesday evening, several explosions were heard in the city centre, an hour after the air raid sirens had sounded. Firemen were quick to arrive on the scene. They were confronted with raging fires, difficult to extinguish. The blast had hit several power stations. Part of the city was plunged into darkness. The consequences of the missile strike on Lviv are still ongoing. The strikes targeted three power plants. As a result, there are cuts in electricity supply. Two people were injured. They are receiving medical assistance. The strikes also targeted pumping stations, causing water cuts. Relatively unscathed at the beginning of the conflict, Lviv, a large city in western Ukraine, has become a city of refuge for thousands of Ukrainians. But in recent weeks, the shelling has become a lot more frequent. On Tuesday evening, strikes were also reported in several other regions of Ukraine, including Transcarpathia, a region bordering Hungary, hit for the first time since the beginning of the Russian invasion. The fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is being felt around the world, with global food supplies taking a hit. Both are among the world's largest grain exporters, and as the conflict and sanctions take their toll, countries are shaking up their supply lines, while other grain-producing nations are taking advantage of the shortfall. With no end to the war in Ukraine in sight, countries are moving fast to either secure wheat supplies or gain global market share for their crops, as Ukraine's production is hit hard. According to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, around 50 countries import 30 percent of their wheat from either Russia or Ukraine, with some countries importing up to 60 percent. 
According to the Wall Street Journal, Russia, despite sanctions, has been able to export its wheat to some countries. And while Ukraine has struggled to bring its crops to market, Russia has gained ground. Citing AgFlow, a Switzerland-based crop data firm, the paper said, Egypt's wheat imports from Russia grew 580 percent in March from a year ago, adding exports to Iran, Turkey and Libya all more than doubled. Other countries are also increasing their market share with countries trying to gain new supply lines. Exports from other grain-producing countries on the Black Sea, such as Bulgaria and Romania, also grew in March, according to the firm, with wheat shipments from South American countries including Brazil and Argentina more than doubling, while those from Australia rose nearly 75 percent. Governments around the world are working to make up for lost grain supplies. In March, Ireland launched a nearly 11 million U.S. dollars program to encourage farmers to grow more crops such as wheat, oats and barley, hoping to reduce that country's dependence on imported grain. The Biden administration last week asked Congress for 500 million U.S. dollars to help boost U.S. crop production in an effort to make up for global shortfalls. However, the Wall Street Journal reported that with the amount of production that Ukraine was responsible for, along with massive acreage usually utilized, it will be impossible to make up the shortage despite global efforts. The leak of a U.S. Supreme Court draft opinion that would overturn the constitutional rights to abortion is a major breach of confidentiality that has heightened the stakes in an already politically charged case. A draft of a U.S. Supreme Court opinion that would overturn the constitutional right to abortion sent shockwaves through the nation, not only because of the contents, but because it was leaked. Politico on Monday night published a draft majority opinion it obtained that would, if it stands, strike down the landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade, a ruling that was not expected for at least another month. Chief Justice John Roberts on Tuesday called the leak a betrayal and vowed to find out who did it. In the draft decision, five conservative justices voted to overturn Roe. It wasn't clear how Roberts would vote. In a statement Tuesday, Chief Justice Roberts said if the leak, quote, intended to undermine the integrity of our operations, it will not succeed. The work of the court will not be affected in any way. But in the wake of this stunning disclosure, experts did predict chaos inside the court, whose longstanding tradition of confidentiality and trust surrounding its deliberations helps lend the institution an air of removal from the more political branches of government. Thousands of people in drought-stricken northern view Mexico fled their homes in the past few days as high winds and hot temperatures drove the largest active wildfire in the United States towards their historic towns. Thousands of northern New Mexico residents have been told to evacuate their homes since Sunday as the largest active U.S. wildfire threatened to consume historic towns in its path. William Sandoval was among those who fled the town of Chacon, taking his dog Copper after authorities told him to go. Dramatic satellite images released on Sunday show the scale of devastation from the raging Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak wildfire northeast of Santa Fe. It's already scorched more than 121,000 acres of land. That's more than half the area of New York City. High temperatures and erratic winds were keeping the fire spreading at, quote, dangerous speeds and in different directions. That's according to an alert issued by the Santa Fe National Forest Services and what's making it difficult for fire crews to control the massive blaze in the drought-hit area. The fire has destroyed hundreds of properties and forced the evacuation of dozens of settlements in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains, though so far it has claimed no human lives. It's the most destructive of a dozen blazes in the southwest, which scientists say are more widespread and arriving earlier this year due to climate change. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. France's left-of-centre parties were close to a broad alliance for June parliamentary polls, hoping that a united front can force President Emmanuel Macron to share power with the left during his second term in office. Momentum appears to be building for Jean-Luc Mélenchon in his attempt to gather force to confront Emmanuel Macron once again at the ballot. 
And all together, we can form a new left bloc, and all together, we can win what we call the third round, that are the legislative elections that are coming in June. And if we win those elections, then we can have Jean-Luc Mélenchon as prime minister. Mélenchon, who leads the far-left France Unbowed party, garnered nearly 8 million votes in the first round of the presidential election and nearly qualified for the runoff vote. On Monday, he inched closer towards uniting the French left, clinching a deal with the Green Party not to stand competing candidates in electoral constituencies and back the idea of a Prime Minister Mélenchon. The coalition promised to put the minimum wage at €1,400 a month and lower the retirement age to 60. It also said it's prepared to disobey certain EU rules that would impede some of its plans, like big spending and nationalising energy firms. That stance on the EU is a major ideological sticking point, however, in talks with the socialists. Mélenchon left the party in 2008 after failing to dilute its pro-EU stance. I think we'll be able to find a compromise on the question of Europe. The issue has fractured the left for the past 30 years. It can't be resolved in a week. And of course, forging a political coalition does not mean everyone thinks the same. Meanwhile, the Communist Party has decided to join the coalition despite differences. Mamadi Domboya, who is leader of the West African Nations Army, said during a televised address that the government transition to civilian leadership would take place over a period of 39 months. The military junta in Guinea said its transition back to civilian rule will probably take more than three years. The proposal is likely to upset West Africa's political bloc that has called for a swift return to constitutional order. Speaking on state television on Saturday, Colonel Mamadi Domboya, the head of the junta that took power in a coup last September, laid down the transition timeline for the first time. From all the consultations undertaken at all levels since the beginning of the transition and with all the components of the nation and with all of the Guineans everywhere, a median proposal for a 39-month transition has been chosen. De 39 mois. Domboya said the 39 months was the average timeline that emerged from consultation with political parties and civil society groups, which his main opponents boycotted. It is not clear when the 39-month period would start. The National Front for the Defense of the Constitution, or the FNDC, a coalition of political parties and civil society organizations, condemned the plan. <laughs> Military leaders have snatched power in Mali, Burkina Faso and Guinea over the last two years, raising concerns of a backslide in democracy in West Africa that over the past decade had begun to shed its reputation as a coup belt. The coups have put the countries at odds with the Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, which is trying to put power back in civilians' hands. ECOWAS has imposed sanctions on Guinea's junta leaders, but not on the wider economy. A spokesperson declined to comment on Sunday. We have some good news for you. Prevention, people say, is better than cure, and that is precisely what a group of researchers here are hoping to do with regard to possible gas leaks at industrial plants. A group of South Korean researchers have developed a type of technology that can detect gas leaks at industrial compounds. Composed of multiple layers of nanofibers, the small metallic sheet changes color to black once it enters a glass container full of hydrochloric acid. This time, the white sheet turned yellow when exposed to a different type of gas. According to the developers, the sheets are coated with special nanofibers highly reactive to specific gases. We developed this sensor by integrating color-changing pigments to a nanofiber sheet at thin as a 200th of a hair strand. With the relatively large area that the fibers can cover, they can detect even a small amount of gas. The sensors also consist of key materials used to prevent gas leaks at semiconductor and display plants. For the most optimal results, a set of sensors must be installed on each gas pipe with each serving different purposes. The first sensor would monitor the fiber's color every 10 seconds, while the other would reassess the status of the gas and send the signal to the central monitoring system once it detects a leak. When leaks occur, the sensors are designed to open up a valve to house the toxic gas inside an empty container 
thus preventing any fatal accidents. Our color sensing nanofiber is embedded inside a safety device that prevents gas leaks, which helps detect potential leaks in advance. As gas leak related incidents have taken their toll on South Korean chip and display plants, the new fiber sensors are seen as a reliable safeguard that can reduce accidents moving forward. Amber Heard's personal nurse testified that she observed Heard with a bloody lip and claimed she witnessed the actress during drugs and alcohol. Heard's lawyers later asked the judge to throw out the lawsuit, which was denied as she is set to take a stand this week. Tonight, new details painting an even darker picture of an off-screen romance gone bad between two Hollywood A-listers. On that occasion, you observed that she did; she had a bloody lip, correct? Correct. And she told you that that was a result of um, the altercation with Mr. Depp, right? The court hearing from Amber Heard's personal nurse. In pre-recorded testimony, citing the nurse's notes, attorneys asked about a 2015 visit to the actress's Los Angeles penthouse, where she said she found Heard with an injury, but added she never saw Heard or Depp abuse each other. The nurse, actually called to the stand by Depp's team, also told the court Heard had reported a history of bipolar disorder, anxiety, and addiction issues, mainly alcohol and cocaine. And she recalled resentment in the relationship. Do you recall Ms. Heard ever telling you that she thought Mr. Depp was um, cheating on her? No, I don't recall that specifically. I just, as I've said, have a general sense of uh, remembering jealousy being an issue. Depp is suing his ex for defamation after she wrote a 2018 op-ed in the Washington Post describing herself as a public figure representing domestic abuse. The actor claims he never abused her and said the op-ed, which never directly mentioned Depp, did irreparable damage to his career. His agent testifying yesterday, Depp has become a Hollywood pariah. Zero. No studio films. Depp is suing for $50 million, arguing Heard, in fact, abused him. His bodyguard testifying he saw Heard punch Depp in the face during a heated argument. And whose fist was that? That was Miss Heard's fist, Amber Heard's fist. Heard is countersuing for $100 million, denying she abused her ex-husband. In the case of that punch, previously arguing in court records, it was to protect her sister. After weeks of graphic testimony... This is not helping, you stupid This is not helping! Depp's team rested today. Heard's lawyers moved in, asking the judge to throw out the suit, arguing Depp failed to prove his case. The court should grant the motion to strike because the undisputed evidence is that he did in fact, abuse Amber. The judge denied that motion, the decision setting the stage for another headline-grabbing moment. Heard herself is expected to take the stand tomorrow. This after the star abruptly fired her PR team, with sources telling she's frustrated coverage of the graphic trial has so far favored her ex. Tonight, Heard's team gears up for a highly anticipated attempt to turn the tide. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Pfizer beat its Q1 earning estimates, boosted by sales of its COVID-19 vaccine and antiviral drug Paxlovid. The company posted a net income of over 7.8 billion US dollars in the first quarter, up from over 4.8 billion dollars a year ago. The U.S. saw record levels of job openings and workers quitting in March. According to the U.S. Labor Department, there were 11.5 million available positions, up from 11.3 million the previous month. That's the largest number since related data was recorded first in 2000. North Korea fired a ballistic missile towards the East Sea, marking the regime's 14th missile test so far this year. It was launched while South Korean lawmakers were holding a confirmation hearing for the incoming government's Minister of Defense. Biogen CEO Mikhail Wonat sources is to step down as a drug maker announces plans to pull back on selling the Alzheimer's drug Adalem. Authorities in New Delhi have been unable to extinguish the fire at a landfill site and reduce the smoke rising from it, posing a risk of health-related problems to the locals. Firefighters have also been trying to extinguish the blaze that broke out late last month at the Baswala landfill site.
And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you've missed any of the stories we had tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with visuals of the Italian Alps that were lit up by 29 light installations as part of a light festival in Bressanoni. Thank you for watching. Good night.